Hello, welcome back. I know that everyone just already saw, <laughs> saw my face speaking to you earlier. Um, so I am so excited to be here and like even just have, oh gosh, these amazing people in this talk. Oh, I'm just living like my queer non-binary dreams for real. Um, I'm just so thankful to just even be able to um yeah have you all as part of um, the festival and kicking off the last day like oh yes let's go um so i'm not going to do too much speaking i'm just going to say what the talk's called um the chat and then i'm going to pass over to meg and um, let me just do my little 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 intro um so this talk is called dreaming the future for trans people um and i just want to do some housekeeping as it's the first talk of the day um, and to just make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, so, you no know, racist, transpho transphobic, homophobic, any phobic behavior is just not going to be tolerated <laughs> um, in the chat or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, we won't really be explaining if we're deleting your comments either. So, there's also that. Uh, so, Meg, I would just like to pass over to you to start this wonderful talk. I'm going to dip out. Um, and everyone, please, if you've got questions, be asking um, in the uh, the stage chat uh, throughout. And uh, yeah, we will kind of do that too. So yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Hi. Hiya. Hi. 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 Danielle, we can't see you. Oh, oh we can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, welcome to Dreaming a Future for Trans People. Um, this idea came about because uh, Imi messaged me to go, do you want to do like a trans thing? Choose someone who you would, I'm like, there isn't just one, and they, we could have done about nine, but I figured any more than four would have been um, like t t hard to wrangle. So I invited like three people who are really in my heart um, around being trans who are also really important. I think you all are really important voices in thinking about what being trans and non-binary and gender non-conforming is. Um, so I thought it would be nice to start, because actually we're all, we all know each other, we're all friends. Um, I thought it would be nice to remember to go, how did you all meet each other? So I'm thinking about Danielle to start with. And I met Danielle at Trans Pride in, in Brighton. 2018? 2018? I have no idea. I, I don't remember, remember the date, but it, it must have been Travis, maybe Travis Salamanca went. Two years ago. Oh, uh, you got to meet Danielle. I think you're going to love her. And I've loved her ever since. Um, <laughs> it was July 2018. Wow, huh? look at you knowing the date. I remember having the phone conversation with Meg afterwards when you were talking about transpiring, going out in the evening and how liberating it was and what an expression. Yeah, as it goes. Um, when, Pichinga, when did you meet Danielle? When? In 2017, summer, um, <clears throat> I did like a um, writer's group for black queer trans peoples and that was at the open barbers yeah you got a good um, memory yeah and <laughs> i remember you came like like 15 minutes late and had strength you had like you were this bikini <laughs> <bit of life. laughs> <laughs> And some sort of like, you know, like, you know, the kind of like um, baggy, like work trousers that you get at the flea market oh, Lord. elsewhere. <laughs> you know I mean? Like, really doing all of that kind of like effortless shit. <laughs> and a do rag, you know, before Solange's cover. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, you're calling me out. You're calling me out. Damn. <laughs> 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 and do you know when did you meet Danielle? So I, I think we only I think we only met last year at in Manchester Trans at the, at the Trans Vegas, yeah. And yeah. I think I remember you because we were on a panel about films. Yeah, and I don't think I, I don't think I've ever said to you this, but but you impressed me hugely because I said I've just had a new book come out. Has everyone bought it? And you just turned to me and said, 
no, I'm not buying it. And it was just like this, <laughs> kind of kind of, it was this brilliant moment of kind of honesty that people just don't do. Oh, God. People don't do that That's kind of funny. honesty. <laughs> but the thing is, is that like, like I'm from Peckham. And it's like I always, I treat my, my each book like a market store, and in some kind of way, I love that honesty because it's like we don't need to kind of like BS around with stuff, and we mm. shouldn't need to BS around with stuff. And that always stuck with me, in the sense that you were the only person that, that I've kind of said that to, and they've gone, "No, I'm not buying it. It's not for me." It's just like such a such a moment, really. So for me, that's how we met. <laughs> and I'm thinking about Daniel's work of. Um, particularly the Black Trans Archive, which if you haven't, like, if people listening haven't been to, like, you'll need to go. And I went and saw it at the Science Gallery in London, and I just sat there for, like, two hours, ignoring the people I was with, going through different routes, um, watching other people go through different routes, Mm -hmm. and it was just... Like the bit where there's a bit where um, you can bury your dead name, and it just mm. will take you. And it, honestly, I think it like it to, it actually changed my life. So um, Daniel's Daniel does beautiful. You can play it online. Which is also now, why I invited you here because I also think about you're thinking a lot about the future for, yeah. for trans people. Um, <coughs> Kachenga, Juno, when did you meet Kachenga? <gasps> I was about to take a sip of water and I was like, oh, I can't take it now. I'm going to talk about me and Kachenga. And for writing my first book, I don't know if you bought that one either, Danielle, but he could no. I've sent you a whole set of books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send me a copy uh, now. <laughs> I will do. But, um, I interviewed Kachenga for my, for my first book that came out a few years ago now. Seems kind of weird to talk about first books. But anyway, I interviewed Kachenga for that. And weirdly... But like years before then, I used to work as a teacher in uh, Brixton, Stockwell, Brixton. And um, my drive to work was around a roundabout and there would always be traffic on the roundabout. There'd always be traffic everywhere. It was London. It was kind of central. So there'd always be traffic everywhere. But I would sit for ages on this roundabout and I would look at the houses and there was a set of houses. And I'd always say in my brain, who lives in a house like that? And scroll forward five years. I, Kachenga gives me their address and then I walk down to see and Kachenga lives in that house in this kind of weird cheese shaped house and um, yeah yeah in interviewing Kachenga's interview stayed with me in a way that kind of almost no other interview stayed with me it stayed with me as a kind of uh, I, I mean I've talked about this before for me it's always emotional talking about that interview it stayed with me as a kind of guiding light in terms of this is how this is what a good interview feels like and really weirdly somebody just said to me about the book that's just come out last week you interview in a certain kind of way and a lot of the time I put that down to interviewing Kachenga it was really everything was done I kind of felt Kachenga's terms in every way I felt like I had to be on her terms and and rightly so and that kind of stuck with me. For me, it was like the most important interview that I've done. One of the most important interviews I've done. So that's how I met Kachenga. And their work, boy, their work, hmm. their writing. You know, and again, I do this in every possible. You know, Kachenga is, is one of the voices of today. Kachenga, Kachenga's writing is poetic. It is future. <laughs> you know, it really is future. It is it's everything that you want writing to be. It's like it's writing that you dive into and you stay in there because it's like you're surrounded by all the stuff that you need life to be. And that doesn't mean that it's always easy. And it doesn't mean that it's always nice words. It just means that actually this is what writing should be. So, yeah, Kuchenga is a, a complete star in my eyes. And in Berlin, really, it's completely, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, a, yeah, big deal for me. It's an emo- it, talking about Kachenga and Kachenga's writing is always emotional for me. And I think we met. Think Kachenga about that meeting, about the interview, about meeting Juno. Oh. Can't hear you. We can't, can't hear you. Hey, uh, sorry, say that again, babes. I was meeting. Juno, what, like, do you, what, do you remember <laughs> about meeting Juno? 
I do. I remember that it was too hot. I had the heating on, and it was like late <laughs> spring. Disgusting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I am. Um, so yeah, I had to like open the window, um, and I do recall um, it being on my terms. I didn't know. I mean, I didn't know you to trust you yet. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And so I'd read. You were in, I think, Refinery29 and Cosmo, maybe. And so I, started, like, I knew. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, oh, okay. But also, for me, like, as a journalist and a writer, I know <clears throat> I know what they're looking for. Do you know what I mean? And so, so I'm like, I'm, I'm absolutely assured, do you know what I mean, that I'm going to give you something rich that, you know, that's going to spark off. I know how to meet your assessment objectives, but at the same time, <clears throat> um, in the years previous to that, um, I'd had so many instances where I had trusted people too early and found myself being asked about trauma, abuse, surgery, mm. body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So <clears throat> I feel like I've, kind of perfected the ability to give of myself but to let them know no further mm. and stuff um but at the not the end actually like maybe a third of the way through i was like you know that um a scene of um beyonce at the beginning of hold up where she like opens the door is ocean and the waters like fresh out and stuff <laughs> yeah. it's like um so the 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 questions had been sensitive and compassionate enough that i was like oh we can talk about my childhood we can talk about um you know my experiences in gay male sexual space we can talk about my toys we can talk about them. <laughs> <laughs> i cut off men for jokes yeah, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, like there was an um, an opening up that occurred that was really liberating for me because um, it's so taxing having to be this guarded. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I would love um, to just be able to, you know, just breeze through life, you know, like carefree, you know, mm. whatever, and not have to worry. But I, I'm consciously aware of that. So, like, when when her being announced the space as safe, I it, yeah, it just allowed me to yeah, just um, <clears throat> release my um, what do they call it in yoga? Your bundas, you know, when you like um, that bit of yourself that you like tighten up your central core and stuff, and then you like release it. And mm. stuff. So um, I don't often release that physical part of myself in an interview. I'm like always, you know, smiling and. Yeah, you know, just like trying to kick out and stuff, but I was able to lower my voice a lot to have and breathe into um, how special that moment was. <clears throat> and um, for those of you who don't know, you need to go to kachanga.com, read Kachanga's writing. Um, Kachanga is a is wild and beautiful writer who's also working on a novel. Uh, so if no, you go I to her about page and you read that description and go and tell me that's not a novel mm. I've done too many negatives now that you don't want to read tell me <laughs> tell me. I think, no you navigated that well the knots kind of got through <laughs> that's all right. and then um, Kajenga, I met Kajenga and Gino about the same time so we met at Trans Vegas um, I had a beard and a dress and um I'd messaged you, Kachenga, to say I was coming. Mm. And then there was that night where you and you both were on a panel. And do you know, I saw you holding your femininity in a way that I just went, oh, that's what I want. And we had a chat. And then I managed to elbow my way into the speaker dinner. <laughs> Jenga's like, no, you're coming, you're coming, babe. Come I'm on. British, just stop it. No, what happens was, <laughs> oh god, yeah, yeah. the panel was me and Lester in that wooden room that was, you know, it smelled divine. And the light was special. It was like sunset and everything. You know, it was like just that perfect hour and stuff. So, 
that was lovely. And then at the end, we were all going for dinner and like the energy was such, Meg, that you were like, you know, we were talking and bonding or whatever. And then we like, we're obviously like organically flowing towards the restaurant. And then you were like, oh, no, are you sure it's all I'm coming? I was like, you know what I mean? Like, you're stop being ridiculous. Of course you can't be. <laughs> 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 and then um, the next day was Charlie Craggs doing the to, to My Trans Sisters event. Yeah. And um, uh, so that's a collection of, oh, I've got it behind me. Um, that's a collection of letters written by trans women and feminine people to either the younger selves, which links into our conversation, um, or to other young younger trans siblings. And um I just stood at the back and just cried and cried and cried oh. and hmm. went up to Kachenga afterwards and just said, I think I'm a girl. And you just looked at me and went, okay, I'm with you. Oh. And like you have been ever since, like you're my sister. And oh. that's been, so this is why I want to inv bring all three of you along kind of a bit selfishly to go, you've all been really <laughs> in my transition and my journey as a trans person. Oh, um, and uh, if you don't know about Juno's work, Juno has just released uh, their third book called Gender Explorers. I'd have to get up to get it. It's on my bed over there. Um, interviewing young trans people um and about their experience and it's pretty much just their words and and the and the interviews and i got through about one the first interview and i'm sobbing on my bed so i'm gonna have to take it <laughs> slow um, there's a theme here meg <laughs> i cried <laughs> that's the theme i cried um I think I was just going to say, just on that last thing, I think that's where for me that there's a kind of nice full circle-ness to this in a sense that I think by the time I came to, you know, interviewing uh, five-year-olds and uh, I think the youngest people I interviewed were kind of four-year-old and a five-year-old and um, and then the parents would always be in the room, they'd always be, you know, they'd be, I, I really had to have got good at interviewing people I had to be able to sit right back <clears throat> and you have to find a way of sitting right back and I really I always go back to to our interview Kachenga as a way of kind of like creating that space so I think mm. by this book it's one of the great joys there's so little of me in this last book literally there's so little I'm not even in the bits between it's like it's Oh. These brilliant young people who literally have never been given the chance to just speak their truth mm. <clears throat> and be heard. They can speak their truth and people go, no, I don't believe you. <laughs> mm. That happens to all of us. But when you're five and somebody says that to you, it shuts you down instantly. So, yeah, oh. for me, there's a lovely full, full circleness for doing this event this week that the book comes out. And Kachenga, who's in Berlin, I'm in Spain. We're miles apart being able to kind of like, to being able to chat. So... Thank you, Meg, for bringing us together in this way. Yeah, thank you, Meg. Thanks, Meg. Okay, and that's our chat. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where do we want to start? Like, you know, you knew you were coming on um, to have a conversation about the future of trans people. I also put in that thing of, like, how do we all get old together? Um, because that's – Kachinga and I were talking – last week a couple of weeks ago about like why is that such a revolutionary idea that trans people mm. get old um, oh. um and i also noticed that we're in intergenerational conversation which i'd never really noticed it's like it's, oh. it's a bit weird in trans where to go oh well, we've got someone in mm. the, someone in the 30s and someone in the 40s and someone in the like but mm. but there is a thing of sorry go oh. on no, no, I finish your sentence. I can cut. I can come in. That, um, <laughs> like, how, like, like there's. I, I think there's a thing also about how, um, like, I uh, am mainly trans because of younger trans people, not older trans people. Like, it was seen mm. on Twitter. Um, trans and non-binary people that really made me realize that I was trans and then but then there's a role 
for elders too. And so I kind of think the idea of like elders and young people gets a bit mixed in trans work. Uh, I've struggled to explain how, um, to what transitioning has done for the concept of time for me. Um, mm. I didn't declare to my <clears throat> immediate friendship circle and whatever until I was like 28 and in rehab. And so because I'd not been sober for like 12 years, um, the time before I got sober is really condensed. You know what I mean? I was like, that was just such a flurry of, you know, dysfunctional, torturous experiences. And so when I think of my time before so, um, I transitioned, because I wasn't sober, it was all just so high octane. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. sh university, straight into freshest week, drugs, 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 rave, 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 you know, and whatever. And then, you know, falling apart, you know, this job getting fired, oh my God, assault, et cetera, whatever. It's just such a maelstrom. And then um, the way that I declared my womanhood was so... Um, it was so loud and so boisterous and it like went straight back to my happiest times when I was um, a child in nursery, you know, dressing in the dresses that I wanted. And, mm -hmm. You know, my nursery teachers were like, you know, so comforting. They adored me. Do you know what I mean? They loved my energy and, you know, I'll coach, I'll, you know, whatever. And I'll, I'll grow up in Tottenham. <laughs> so, like, you know, you know, there were these really lovely white working class ladies who just thought I was just lovely, you know, whatever. <laughs> so, so what happens afterwards in terms of the clamping down was like super tragic, obviously. <clears throat> but when I, as an adult, I was able to do, the, you know, the inner child work that you have to do for recovery, but also I was able to demand that the little girl that I was got everything that she wanted so mm. naming myself like i i <clears throat> i kept my first name because that felt gender neutral enough but my, i used to have my dad's middle name mm. so i changed my dad's middle name to the name that he was going to give his firstborn daughter and stuff mm. so, and, I, so, and then i also um i don't re i don't use my um surname as I say, like, because of the podcast, um, You Must Remember This with um, Karina Longworth, because they did, um, she had this one on Madonna in the 80s, apparently when she met Warren Beatty, like Warren Beatty said, um, don't you feel like women who go by their names, like, you know, is um, going to go by their first names, like the ultimate form of patricide? And like, person was like, what? And, you know, like, well, you know, they're killing off the father. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Do you know what I mean? I, I Happy like, Father's Day. Exactly. <laughs> yes, it was rough. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I think since the transition, like I've just been able to drink in the present moment so much easier. Like I breathe so much. Mm. I want to be here. Do you know what mm. I mean? I want to enjoy my life. Like, do you know what I mean? I, I'm, you know, I'm soft and I'm strong and I'm lovely and I want, I want to enjoy the moment. Like if it's sun, if the sun is shining, I want to glisten. If it's mm. raining and I feel more than I'm able to give myself over to the estrogen waves and feel myself. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm crying. <laughs> <laughs> Hormones for me are just so delicious. And mm -hmm. I said that when I started hormones, I compared it to like, you know, being on like a road trip on like the open road. You know, when you listen to the old radios, it's all crackling. Mm -hmm. When I started taking issue, it's just like, just went melodic, no interference. Mm -hmm. I'm good. I mm -hmm. like the sounds that are coming through. I just <laughs> felt wonderful. Like, yeah. And like, so because my transition has been, it's got, you know, it's been conditioned by violence, obviously, but internally it's been such a joyous experience being able to manifest mm. the divine feminine through myself in the way that I was always called to do. Um, yeah, time has slowed down and I remember so much more because I want to. I want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I mean, that was really beautiful. Put, beautifully put, like I loved, like we often have to reclaim 
so much of our time back, it feels like, you know, because we had to get to a point where we actually wanted to be here. Um, and it's so nice that when you're talking about um, when you were younger and all those teachers adoring you and actually you're saying, actually, I want that person to have what that all the time and have what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And when you finally get that at our ages, you're like, oh my God, <laughs> like this is, this is like, I can just sit there all day and do nothing. It's not about work. It's not about making something for someone else. It's just about like, oh yeah, I'm living in my truth. And this is what the truth feels like, like living in your truth feels bliss, you know, literally feels bliss. Mm -hmm. um, and, may, and every day, you know, we all have things that like, sometimes it's like, mm, I'm not living exactly my truth or like, I'm not there yet or whatever, or like it's some, you know, we're all on a journey and sometimes a journey takes longer than others, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting that we're like such a different a bunch of like generations to be honest because like it's it's so strange because we're we're all still friends and we all still know each other and all still talk to each other and I feel like we kind of lock like trans people lock on to people oh. um and I feel like sometimes it's like an active lock on and sometimes it's an active push away you know oh. um because sometimes there's trans people that are stealth and they want to stay stealth and it's not about being trans for them it's about living uh, their life away mm -hmm. from the community <laughs> um, and and I think because um, I, I used to work in a sex club, and um, that's where I lot met a lot of trans people because they had trans nights, um, and all the trans women were so great. But it was such a strange environment to like meet all these like trans women because um, it was in an environment that uh, the club didn't necessarily um, how to put this weren't necessarily great for the trans women that were there. Mm -hmm. um, and the people that pay, so all trans women came for free, but the people that paid to come in would pay like a lot of money and have a big expectation of what that meant. Um, was and so- Central London? Was this, central, was this in Central London? This was in um, Peckham. Oh, it's all, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so that was really strange, but it was like, and there was like a, it was super strange because there were all types of trans people in all types of ways of passing and all types of like visibilities and stuff. Mm -hmm. There was definitely like a sh kind of particular hierarchy um, mm -hmm. and like sense of like some people would distance themselves from others um, in order to get a, I don't know, I don't know, I don't want to pretend to know what they want, but sometimes it feels like they're like, I went through that stage and I don't want to be near it to be reminded of it or to someone to associate my body with that. Yeah. Um, and that was just like a super, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to call that interesting, but it was a strange thing for me because I was like, oh my God, like I want to get to your stage. And they're like, well, can you like back off? Cause like, <laughs> like <laughs> I'm like trying to talk to them and they're like, excuse me, like I'm actually like beyond you. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, because they're, so, out, they're out here trying to get the trade, do you know what I mean? Like to fulfill exactly. a certain thing. Exactly. Like, oh, not too clocky to roll with. <laughs> like, <laughs> babes, like, <laughs> we can talk on Instagram DM. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really working right now. Exactly. Uh, they're like, excuse me, <laughs> bye. <laughs> But that's what I think is really interesting now because like the idea of like what a trans woman can look like is like has exploded like you know it's, it's so much wider um, and well, um, me and my friends are having conversations about like um, trans women that don't necessarily want to be um, together with the uh, um, certain type of trans people because they're saying like actually no my experience was very different the way I grew up and the way I had to be trans um and with your experience you're allowed to be maybe more freer and have more choices and actually like no I don't want to get rid of this because xyz um and that's what makes I don't know that's what makes this quite feel quite special because it's like actually we all have a common thread of something of mm -hmm. wanting something and we're mm -hmm. all kind of like here to like just chat shit so it's kind of not, I've never had like a panel where it's just like, hey, welcome and chat shit. So, yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should have renamed it. Like, <laughs> people all get together, chat shit. Thanks. I think it's really interesting, like listening to this, because I like I definitely, when I, when I first of all tried to transition, I mean, one, I couldn't, because, uh, you know, I spent, I lost all of my 20s and a big chunk of my 30s to addiction. So in that kind of sense, mm. 
you, you know, I have a kind of recognition with what some of the stuff that you said, Kachenga, in, in that, you know, I just couldn't because you couldn't, you had to be perfect back then. And to be a woman, a woman wasn't a junkie and a sex, you know, you couldn't do that stuff and be a trans woman because trans women back then had to be perfect women. Mm. They literally had to kind of, they had to be beautiful. They had to be tall and leggy. They had to mm. really attract the right kind of cis men. You know, and here am I, you know, sucking cock for a tenner. You know, it's like I'm not, I wasn't that, I didn't fit into that. And also for me, I didn't fit into that that model of femininity. Mm. In fact, I just used to think, well, I'm not going to do that. Because I'm like, I'm a, you know, my, my feminism would rise up before anything else. And I think I'm not wearing, I remember going to, to like my first kind of uh, psychiatrist appointments and then sending me away by saying that I was being awkward. You know, I was I wasn't dressing in the right way. I was was refusing to dress as a woman. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I've like I've got trainers on and jean. I don't understand what more. I'm lit, I like I was literally confused about what more I had to do. Mm. So for me, for a long time, I didn't. I couldn't look up at older trans women because I, I had no relation to them, and it wasn't mm. about not feeling like a feminine. And I think one of the things that we all talk about, or a lot of people that I, I'm kind of close to, is that sense of feminine, but it being a different thing, and being a different, it being a deeper thing, a much mm. more kind of, uh, a, a kind of in uh, a, a kind of bodily thing, rather than this thing that you kind of put onto yourself and you wear it, and you kind of, and that's what you had to do when I tried to transition first of all a long time ago, and you know, in a, in a sense, I had this thing because I've been HIV now for. A, for years and years and in a sense that gave me a kind of distance between me and the whole process because they literally said to me you can't have surgery because you you're mm. HIV you, know, you couldn't even get a dentist in the early days let alone like a vagina off the shelf I mean it just wasn't going to happen mm. so it was kind of like um but I mean I think it's so I think that what's happened in terms of trans community and aging is a bit like you know we've gone through this massive journey in a really few short years Mm. I mean, I couldn't have written the books I'm writing now, even five years ago. They just wouldn't have, no one would have wanted to touch them, let alone read them. It wouldn't mm. have happened. We couldn't have had this conversation. We could have only had a conversation five, six years ago, which was about how, how, how unhappy we were, mm. how close to, you know, and it's like how close to want, wanting to end it all we were at. You know, it's like, mm. You know, so it's like I kind of feel like we've gone through a movement and, and in a sense, we haven't bonded as a, as a real community because this is like a real rarity for this to happen where, like, I'm in my mid-50s now. I say that and, like, every time I say that to my mum, who's been stuck in lockdown with me for four months, she says, well, you're a little bit older than that now. And it's like, <laughs> your brain's nearly here. <laughs> you know, it's like, in a sense, I kind of, like, in, in in a way, again, going back to some of the stuff you said, Kajang, only in my mid fifties. Only since I hit fifty did I start to feel like time and my time and the time around of everywhere I'm kind of got in sync. And I started to kind of luxuriate in my own body, in my kind of my type of femininity and my body, and um, and in the world that I inhabit. I mean, I just feel like there's a there's an in syncness now that never was there before, which is why I was a junkie because I just was like. I can't do this this fast. I need something to slow me down, or I need something to speed me up, or I need, you know, it's like it's. I can't imagine being that person anymore. I like mm. to sit down. And I, I like drink like uh, two sips of a glass of wine, and I think, God, it's like no, I can't do this. I can't even do that anymore. <laughs> I want to feel the, the sun on my skin, and I want to mm. kind of take that time. So, for me, I think it's really, it's really my my influences even in terms of my transit which is kind of and always like a process of becoming you is an ongoing process are often people that are, are younger than me I kind of look down and I think fuck they're just it's fantastic the way that they're kind of picking and choosing how they shape not only their body but the space around their body because that's mm. what you do when you change your body is that you effectively have a kind of ripple out area just around your body that you begin to inhabit as well you know and I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm given such hope for us and aging by the people that are much younger, and that won't, well, you know, I'm not going to benefit from that. But you know, people are really going to benefit from that. It's going to be a, such a different world that we've kind of interviewing five-year-olds that said to me, 
I, I interviewed an eight-year-old. That's the I interviewed an eight-year-old who said to me, and they were with their mum, and they said, "No, mum, don't you remember what happened? Was that I sent you and the head teacher an email on the Friday night to say that you couldn't say that I could change my gender, but you were still going to use the wrong pronoun because just at the moment those two have to match for me in order for me to be happy at school." And I thought, "Fuck!" Oh, you know, it's like <laughs> that's such sophistication in relation to me going to see a psychiatrist and then saying to me, "What knickers have you got on? Would you mm. dress up?" Man at the weekend to me thinking not unless they're paying love yeah. <laughs> and i really think about what this means in terms of like so if you're going to go a future for trans people what, like what we need to do is we need to change the legislation and make sure healthcare and like that is all important but there's also something that's really true about what does it mean about us about trans people wanting to be here like mm. wanting to be in our bodies like i think that's a thing like of all of us saying that there was a time when we didn't want to be here and mm. there's a time when we're more able to be here and i'm also trying to like unpick all this transphobic stuff in my mind about it. it's like mm, it's a bit broken rather than fuck like trans that all the trans people i know who i'm close with are total fucking magic and mm. like the world without the trans people that I know in it, like these are people who are changing shit and not just about gender, you know, like are doing major, major work. And the, the more that trans people were allowed to just like be in our body and be here, well, even literally still be here, um, but but living into how we want to be, like that's, I mean, there's some magic shit in that. I've not, um, <clears throat> still not watched that, um, <clears throat> excuse me that online live with angela davis um she said something about um the existence of trans pro people proving that abolition is possible mm. and i also felt <clears throat> like cheated because when i was in black lives matter uk i wasn't able to go to the dinner with her because i was <clears throat> Giving um, I was on a panel at the Wow Festival, and I was like, "If you'd met me, do you know what I mean?" Like, because I'm, yeah, I've been writing to trans women in prison for event bars since 2016, and <clears throat> even though, like, the letter writing process for me with those women is just, it's very um, it's not banal or mundane, but you know, it's not, it's not sensationalist. It doesn't have, you know, in terms of talking about, I'm, I'm, I'm not. But I'm not going to betray any confidence, it is all, first of all, but also, um, it's just two girls talking, do you know what I mean? As it goes, mm. I'll send in a magazine, I'll send in, you know, the latest Isabel Yende, do you know what I mean? Some, like, cute stationery and stuff, like, it's just about establishing that relationship and letting the staff and the other prisoners know that, you know, um, someone cares about this girl, do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and giving them the opportunity to share. <clears throat> their thoughts about their experience inside and what they want to do when they get out and stuff. But also along with that, because of my um, um, experience with um, the reading that I was encouraged to do by Professor Lambo at Birkbeck and also I met, I did meet Angela Davis in Northern California in 2008. Yeah, that's when it was. Yeah, summer two thousand eight. Because my best friend Frankie was at um, UCS UCSC and stuff. So I think that's when I started reading um, our prisons of Salee. And then my reading around abolition was quite potted and stuff. But until my sister recommended me um, "Woman on the Edge of Time" by Marge Piercy. And I read that in 2015, I think. And that was the first book I've read where I can't really talk about it without spoiling it. So I'll try. <laughs> yeah, but, okay. but you know, the world, the utopian world that's described in that novel is the one that we're trying to create. Mm. You know, we speak mm. about you know, gender and sexuality being a spectrum. Like the world that's described in that is very much that. It's anarchistic. It's communist. It's social. You know, the vision. You know what the way they deal with violence in that mm. society 
is where we're trying to get to. So, and I'm so encouraged by this moment for like, you know, you know, the prison abolition and the defund the police conversations, absolutely. But I'm devastated that it's being divorced from the black feminists that created it. Like, the mm. we wouldn't be here. Like, all of that theory, all of the combat here, River Collective, like, all of that, you know, <clears throat> all of that theory came from them. And, like, we speak about... Um, black like women so reductively mm -hmm. and you know, just as be like like because we're see, like seen as like you know the caretakers and the reformers or whatever but very rarely seen as the theorists and the academics and the mm -hmm. and, you know like <clears throat> the rigor of the intellectual thought that has brought us to this moment mm -hmm. it's philosophy do you know what I mean? Like we are philosophers, and the like. So, and also, like you know, the fact that black trans women specifically are kept out of these institutions, but are still, even now, even in spite of Viana Dior being brutalized on video. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Minneapolis, where George Floyd was murdered, I still got black trans women on my fucking Instagram messaging saying, "Oh yeah, no, I'm still gonna go protest." You know what I mean? In spite of all of the violence that is like through mm. our um, timelines and whatever, <clears throat> still, mm. um, as well as those of us who are divesting and saying, "No, you know what? You ain't marching for me. Hell no! I'm hell to the no. Am I marching for you? <laughs> Literally, absolutely not. <laughs> a long life to lead, and I'm preserving myself for the long term fight." <laughs> Okay, <laughs> literally. So, you know, the breadth of experience, but the resilience, the endurance, the self-preservation. Mm. Black women and black trans women more specifically um, have given me at the current, in the current moment has been so fantastic for me um, to like decide where I am best placed. You know, I'm like being such an avid reader of Toni Morrison and watching the documentary where she was speaking about how in the 60s and 70s, you know, that the work of archiving, Danielle, um, you know, the work of cataloging what's going on right now is not mm. radical, necessary, essential, and that's my place in the movement. And so for mm. writing narratives and an imagination for, a, for Black trans futures and an imagination that that's where I feel my, that's where I feel best place, where I'm able to write stories and to, <clears throat> to, and say things for, you know, the black women's for black women's imagination for us to be able to, you know, to envision a world that's in which we are centered, we are worthy, that we're the leaders and stuff. Yeah, mm. yeah. Like I was reading um, Octavia's Brood, and in the beginning, there's a foreword that says that the like the lives we're living now are science fiction, like the places that black people are in now would be science fiction to the black people in the past. Well, to survive. Exactly. And like, we literally, like, it's it's literally a science fiction that we're living, like. Oh. And as well, like, you you watch, like, um, what did I watch the other day? Um, that What's that film called again? Deep Impact. Yeah, Deep Impact. Mm -hmm. um, and where, you know, they, they have a black president, which is um, Morgan Freeman. And now, again, now we have a black, then we had, a, we had a black president, not anymore, you know. They had a black president, whatever, but, you know, well, let's not talk about that situation. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, it's like, it's like, I feel like that's what crucial, like you can find your place in, in what you have to do right now. Like often it feels like you have to be outside and you have to be doing the marching and doing the being seen and doing, being with all the bodies in the street in order to be making change. But sometimes you being there isn't, uh, productive for yourself or for the people there, you know, and sometimes you being able to be doing your work, being able to be um, sustained and continuing whatever you're doing is the work that needs to be done. And you may not get the recognition because often it takes the longest time in the world for us to get any recognition. But when when that work comes to it, when people start looking at the work, they say, oh my God, this person was doing this work for like 30 years and it's like oh. the most important work. And they were literally telling, they knew what they needed to do and now we're reading it and just understanding that this is so much more important than something that happened that we forgot. 
you know, because they recorded all of that stuff. Um, mm. And that's why I think like archive, you know, like you mentioned archiving, I think archiving is like crucial. I think it's, and I don't think it just comes in the form of taking pictures mm. or like I saw someone scanning protesters. Like, I don't think that's like just the form of archiving. Sometimes the form of archiving is you make a story about what the end result of that protest is. Mm. And then just thinking about the end result can allow you to be like, okay, like, actually, like, yeah, we want to get to that point. Like, what is, what are we thinking about getting to? Like, the mm. idea, idea that <clears throat> police can be abolished, again, science fiction. Like, mm. the idea that Black trans people can live to the age of 80 or 90, again, science fiction, you know, maybe we're living there now. I don't even know. I hope we do. I hope we live to that age. But I just, like, yeah, I just find it so, like, it is important to appreciate that, like, how the work is, that would you. How old is Miss Major? I have no idea. <laughs> go ahead. Um, yeah, just saying that, like, um, yeah, just thinking about like trans futures and all all this stuff. It's like, well, I hope eventually that, like, when my kid grows up, that they have a book. Danielle's gonna be a mom. Yeah, I'm having. I'm gonna be a mom. Um, my my baby mum is right here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's living in Berlin, so we can't be aunties. <laughs> <laughs> when my uh, child grows up, that um, maybe in the curriculum, you know, with there, uh, and that's why I think about trans futures. Like maybe the person that did this new equation is a trans person. You know, like I just imagine them being in places that we could never have thought they could be. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm just waffling, but no, you're not waffling. Can, you, can we stop that? Yeah. Women always take that. <laughs> a really salient, incisive point. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. waffling. Like you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I actually think that actually you, that you kind of put your kind of finger right on it, really. And so for me, like I've been thinking a real lot, like, and this isn't me talking about a book. I actually said on the radio the other night, I'm not trying to plug up because I'm really, I'm not interested in making money. I've never been. I'm not interested in it i've been uh you know my my feet are rooted in marxism and, and in collective work and in creating structures that enable people to have more safety that's the, the whole premise of my stuff so i'm really pissed off that so many people are arguing with jk rowling because all it does is center whiteness again oh it centers oh. whiteness and it centers <laughs> and that's all it does because the people that are arguing with JK Rowling are people that have got privilege and they're arguing about privilege. And you know, listen, uh, I, I was interviewed, yeah, I was, I was interviewed the other night and they said to me, What do you think about JK Rowling? And I think I said, Listen, I'm not going to talk about a wizard expert. You were doing the Whitney Mariah one. Have you seen that one? When, when no. The, Shade and Mariah, like there's this like German interview, and they're like, um, you know, um, yeah, you know, Mariah Carey, she's doing well. Oh, really? Oh, how's she doing? She good? And then like, to Whitney, he said, like, and and what do you think about Mariah? And Whitney says, what do I think about Mariah? I don't think about Mariah. <laughs> 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 but it, it, is, it is to me it's that thing of like, like we, we are not going to have a better curriculum if we're spending mm. our time talking about an old white woman who made lots of money writing about wizards yeah get fucking mm. real because actually in this week i've read about you know i follow a couple of people on on, on instagram who document black lives being taken away mm. being murdered mm. being extinguished in the most awful of ways, and yet you're asking me to sign a petition about J.K. Rowling. Yeah, that's fucking real. Excuse my language. I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but it's like it's like it's the in that for me it's that centering. What we've got to do to create mm. a better future for trans people is to decenter privilege first of all, and that starts with that group of white women mainly who work in publishing because those are the people that get through. Is mm. we've got to decenter those voices. Even if it feels like it feels like a little bit kind of like that, because I have anxiety saying that stuff. Because I suffer, my, my career suffers because of saying this stuff, and rightly so, because that's the way that you decenter. But I mean, I really feel like we, whilst we're trying to get to a better space, mm. we're still caught up. We we imagine that arguing with J.K. Rowling or arguing about a a cue, a surgery, is the mm. thing that we should be doing now with our time, rather than looking at 
doing an investigation, finding out how many people that aren't white are in that queue for surgery. How many of them are even in that security? Because we know that they're treated badly by the healthcare full stop. Mm. You know, it's like, we, it's like there's so many, that, that's the thing that depresses me, even as I get, and I'm kind of getting, I feel like I've been doing this work since the 80s, and I feel like I'm tired, I'll admit that, because you do, you get to this kind of age and you go, I don't think I can go out and march anymore because it's like, I just, I don't know what I can, I feel desolate really by the whole Trump, J.K. Rowling stuff by people sending me petitions to sign about J.K. Rowling. I feel it, it feels desperate to me mm. that it's that in a week when we when when there are other things we should all be putting that to bed now, and we should all go and and I agree with you, Kachenga. We should be we should be raising the voices, marching, giving up our spaces for Black trans women mm. who actually are creating the change that needs to be created in every walk of life, not just for trans people. Mm. They're creating it in terms of education. They're creating it in terms of, but you know, the thing is, is that we don't need to have, I don't need to have some kind of paternalistic part in that. What I need to do is just give up the table. Mm. The thing. And that's, that I think is really difficult for people to do. It's really difficult for white people to do because even when, you know, I, I keep on seeing pictures of fields in, in Somerset of white people taking the knee. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in a field taking the knee and then putting it on instagram as if that's going to make any difference you know it's like structure i've worked, done a lot of work in and around hiv then though it's kind of like you know when we um like some like say that the favorite i believe is um leaflet you know from like the late 18th early 19th century you know or even like william blake for example i love mm. william blake so much but um you know there's that poem about the little black child like oh lord oh my my skin is black but my soul is white you know and, <laughs> <laughs> like that was like the height of you know white liberalism at the time you know and it goes this was like you know the guy you know if you were a slave on the run in london you know you could probably you know hide out in their attic for like you know a few days at least <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and like now thinking about you know <clears throat> you know George taking a knee in Somerset and you know, Maud, it's fine, you know. And, you know? Mm, mm. <laughs> and yeah, you know, we can love it, but but for them, for whiteness, you know, to reckon with itself, like I think I don't know how much of a sea change it's going to be, but at the same time, it's about them. Do you know what I mean? It's not helping like black liberation or anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's in that way, but for them, in terms of being able to look into the mirror and say, you know what? Because I'm white, I've faced, I've received, I've not had to deal with a certain set of experiences which would have impinged upon me. And, you know, I've just got, I've got to sit with that at some point. Maybe it's going to be, you know, three days, you know, maybe it's going to be five minutes, but, you know, until it's going to become, going to become a daily part of their lives, mm. they begin to lose the discomfort around any mm. race discourse, you know, that's where we're heading. <clears throat> but I think with regards to, like the centering of like, like say the JK staff and whatever. I was, I always, I wondered when it was happening, I was like, I'm not affected by this at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, same. I didn't even read any of her books. Like, <laughs> like, I don't, I literally don't have the time. I don't mm -hmm. have the time, like, I, you know, all of everything that she said. Do you know what I mean? Turfs aren't new. Mm -hmm. They're not fresh. They <laughs> Over and over again. All right, here we go. <laughs> it's all of that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I see everyone coagulating and circling around them on Twitter, and I think, <clears throat> you know, it's so short sighted because there's some immediate relief for people in the culture wars of right now. Do you know, mm -hmm. what I mean? but, you know, the right are a bit more clear and say, you know, um. Ben Shapiro owning, you know, like whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it too. Do you know what I mean? People mm -hmm. don't do her like open statements saying, well, yeah, this is wrong and this is right. that, this is that. And like, okay, do that if you've got the time. But I think it's weird that people will do that, but they won't. <clears throat> 
think outside of the prescribed reading list, okay, which have been mm. being shared, you know, God, you know, God has blessed Rennie Edo Lodge and UJ Imolo and, you know, everyone, you know, the Tanahasi Coats and everyone, of course, absolutely. But there's a whole host of black trans creators who are not getting that shine. Do you know what mm. I mean? What about Plate? Okay, what about Diamond Styles and Z and Mia? What about um, Tea Time and Ashley, um, Tea Time with the Girls of Tea Time Network with Ashley Breathe and Fox Giselle and, you know, Black Trans TV, you know? What, and what mm. about like, the Black Trans people that I don't know? Do you know what I mean? It's still, mm. like, it's not like an elitist cabal, but, you know, like the fact that I'm trying my best to be in contact with, you know, the black trans voices of today yeah they may be grassroots but like i don't have contact with the girls in brazil angola mm. france i don't do you know what i mean like the, that's <clears throat> the next frontier and like i can of course i know how disgraceful the publishing industry is do you know and it's hot it's been so hard for me i can't even pretend i've like <clears throat> the honesty that certain white um, writers are having right now about what they're paid and seeing people who are younger than me don't have my bylines or whatever and being fast tracked giant mm. stuff. and yeah. like i've spent years like you know studying like how to break into publishing whatever and i'm now passing that knowledge on to others who are getting yeah. the book deals and the agents yeah. and whatever that i can't get Mm. It's, really it's, it's, a, it's absurd it's a completely it, you know the thing is is it, it comes down to that thing and it's like as you were talking about kind of other countries so like i've done lots of research around hiv and and you know because i wrote a piece about four years ago now for them in america which was where i said that because i got really pissed off because i kept seeing white women go up on stage or white men go up on stage Amen. And, to, and say trans women are the most at risk from HIV. And I'd go, no, hold on a minute, hold on a minute from the audience. You know, I'd go, like, I've read that data, I've analysed that data, I've written about that data, and actually it's not all trans women, it's black and brown trans women in Latin America and in North America and in Asia who are having to engage in sex work and who don't have any whatever, who are being, you know, they're also the women that are being murdered and for whom the shock law is being kind of invoked in America. So that the person that murders them doesn't have to have any crime. Mm. And it kind of it's like I, I realized a long time ago that it's like a, like the fights that we're picking, that we're choosing to have, are kind of they're easy kind of lines to stand up and say, because if you stand up on stage and go, trans women are the most at risk, everyone mm -hmm. in the room goes, Oh, I've got no idea, I'm gonna clap. But mm. if you kind of like if you say to them, no, do more. Do more than that because the fight that we don't and you see like the jk running the fight that we don't need to have isn't with them it's we need to think globally about how i stop you know my work for the last four or five years has been about how i in in, in how i work with people to ensure that you know like women in peru or women in honduras or women in brazil who are dying in droves of aids when they shouldn't be because we have Mm. For them, why is a white man in San Francisco doing research on them using research material on a white man in San Francisco? You know, mm. it's like if, right. you know, that, that we need to start to become more nuanced, deeper, more. It, we need to interrogate much more. And I think I saw Travis ask a question, and I think that mm. what white people need to do, Travis, is stop saying. I sometimes get people coming up, you know, you know twenty-six-year-old white men coming up and slapping my back and saying. I've got you, don't worry. I'm an ally. And I think, you know, it's like I was sucking cock for money before you were born. You, you don't need to be an ally. You need to leave the room. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to do. We need to leave the room, but we need to leave the room fully equipped. We need to leave the room financed. Mm. We need to leave the room with book deals. Mm. You know, it's like if you look at di the, uh, dialogue, I mean, it's dialogue publishing. Yeah, how do you like yeah. Charmaine? You know, it's like we need to make sure that those kind of publishing houses are funded to produce mm. work and not just a one-off book. So that, you know, we shouldn't have a, you know, one of the things that was brilliant about this week, but was also sad, was that you know you had like brilliant black writers saying, "I've got to number one." It's the first time it's happened, and I think, mm. you know, it's 2020. I know, isn't it? 
2020. And you know, the thing is about that list of publishing paintings is that everyone that anyone that uh, that kind of put forward their stuff mm. on the whole, people that put forward they put forward their stuff because they were always doing better. Mm. Like and you know, there's like it's they can, you know, I think there's a kind of commonality to that, a commonality to being a trans writer. Because whenever I try to publish a new book, everyone says to me, no one's going to read it, so we can't pay you very much. I get that mm. all the time. No one's going to read it, so you can't pay you very much. And actually, you know, we can't, you know, we need to claim back some words. As, as white people, we need to stop using words like intersectional about us and about class and about other stuff because it doesn't, when I walk in the room, no one knows my class, especially if mm. I'm wearing like a blue polka dot blouse. No fucker knows what class I am. <laughs> So we need to stop. We need to stop. We've really got. Well, we've got to start being tougher. We've got to start being more rigorous as white mm. people. We've got to stop thinking that if we sit in a field on one knee for mm. two minutes, or we go outside and clap for the nurses, we're doing fuck all. You know, nearly every single healthcare worker that died in the UK during COVID has not been white. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, nothing's happened about that. We had we had to get them. We had to get the government to allow the the family of those people that had died to have confidence. You know what the fuck are we doing? Don't be on your knees. Mm. March. You know that's why I had a real issue with like I picked up on people, white people doing the black square, but you know the kind of play. And I was like, what the fuck are you being silent for? Mm. How dare you? How dare you occupy a space that is being occupied by people because they need rest? Mm. You know, what we need to do is to get up there and demand more all the time. Go into work on Monday morning and say, listen, there doesn't seem to be a single black or brown person working in this firm. Why not? Risk it. Yeah. I mean, mm. those things are beginning to happen. You know, I'm yeah. seeing more statements, more tweets, more et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But like when I think about who's been of help to me in the past six, to 18 months specifically, it's been black women, black <clears throat> black trans women. Like I've been, in terms of who's been doing the mutual aid, the donations, the sharing of PayPal's, the sharing of um, <clears throat> GoFundMe's and everything. It's actually the people with the least. So I think like we're mm. really aware of the need for like these mutual aid sort of programs, you know, like, and it's, it's really funny that it's those people who have, literally just got, do you know what I mean? Just got a little breather. Do you know what I mean? As it goes, they've just got their first few thousand, whatever, and they're, that's the, they're, they're, because of their involvement in these politics and whatever, they're like, let me hand this down now and stuff. Those, it's the old money that we need to go after. Do you know what I mean? Where it's really mm. up and stuff. And like, <clears throat> when it comes to, um, you know, resourcing, financing, um, you know, in places and allowing us to be leaders. <clears throat> I have only been able to become a writer, if I'm being fully frank and honest, because of my sexual relationships with white men. If mm. I slept with the rich lawyers and the architect and whatever, if I'd not done that, I wouldn't have got to rehab. I wouldn't have been able to afford my open university course to even mm. be positions have a few moments in a day to write that's really what happens <clears throat> like i don't have any shame in that and i think it's probably because of the tradition of sex working in trans communities whatever it's like yeah yeah i'll start there for money and it helps like literally what, is that? <laughs> Do you know what i mean like, i don't have that same level of sexual shame that i think a lot of um cisgender people do um <clears throat> but still like, I'm, th I'm thinking now and it didn't really get me far enough Mm -hmm. And when I'm seeing these declarations of privilege, like, um, yeah, Jamie Windows put up a thread the other day talking about their how much how much their white privilege has helped them in the publishing industry, and um, it wasn't about me specifically, but they said something um, about the fact that yeah, they got a, a book publishing deal and they hadn't, you know, they hadn't even had published that many articles. And it was mm. seen as palatable and you know because of their um ability to um entertain you know the queer spectacle element of it and you know there's a familiarity with the way that they present their gender as well you know like, oh it's the new boy George you know and, and stuff mm. 
Like, I can't do that. I'm just a black girl from around the way. Do you know what I mean? Mm. <laughs> so it's like, I am and... trying to write wondrous I'm definitely trying to create worlds and stuff. But yeah, I mentioned your polka dot blouse, um, Juno, because I feel like in terms of what I'm presenting gender wise, I'm fighting Holly Willoughby down at Marks and Spencer's for the lady. <laughs> <laughs> no, Holly, it's mine. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so unless you're able to create, you know, this. Um, you know, glamazon transsexual stuff. Because you mentioned that about um the leggy um transsexual of the 80s and stuff, mm. you know, Caroline Cossies and whatever. And they've done that. We did everything we could to assimilate, you know, to be as binary as possible, answered their questions. If you look at those old interviews of them on the Donahue show, on the Oprah show, uh, you know, and everything. We've answered their invasive questions. We've talked about our genitalia. Mm. We've presented ourselves as, you know, as, you know, as feminine and sexually available and glamazon as possible. We're not fucking free. It's not work. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And we're not. I, like, and I'm gr I'm very grateful that for the black trans uh, radicals of today and whatever, none of us are saying, you know, oh yeah, we need a we need a black trans woman as president. You know, that that's going to be, you know, that's the pinnacle. No, we know that that's not going to help us. That's not going to mm. have the, the lightest skinned, thinnest, most eloquent, most erudite, most educated black mm. child to become the next um, president of America. That's not going to help. or It's not going to help us. Mm. As it goes. And, and I've been thinking about that thing of like someone... Uh, coming out and saying, oh, wow, look, I've got all these opportunities. Come on, guys, let's, we really need yeah. to think about this. There's an extra step of going, well, why the fuck have you got that, like, that deal? I'm not Open your purse. falling Jamie out, but, like, Open like your purse. What, why have we got Open that? And then why, what, why do you not say no? Hold on, no. I know four <laughs> other writers who are so much better than me. <laughs> They've been doing it for longer. Give it to them. I'll introduce mm. you. Yeah, that's yeah. I I was so pissed about this whole um, Twitter thing because it's like they're saying, "Oh my god, I got paid this much!" Or like, "Oh my god, this happened!" "Oh my god, I feel bad!" But it's like you're not doing shit. Mm. You're not doing shit, but all you're doing is putting off some guilt. And you said, "I did my thing." Um, all the comments were like, "Well done for saying this. Well done, babe." And it's like, "Well, actually, you've done nothing. Like, actually, you literally did nothing." Because I know in two years you'll take the next book deal, and you'll probably write about how you felt about it in that moment. And then in three more years, you'll write a book deal about um, a story about a black trans woman. And in five more years, you'll make a film about it. And it's like you're not actually you don't want to change any infrastructure. You want to say something in the moment that makes you feel more relevant and makes you feel like oh actually you do care and then in two years you got rid of all your black friends like I just like I, I find this like time tiring because you have we have all this like we talked about so much we're probably your Kachang your inbox your inbox is probably flooded with like people wanting free interviews and about x y and z and and you'll probably do an interview and they won't talk about any of your work they'll say like like I had an interview <laughs> on Saturday and they were supposed to talk about blacktransarchive.com and all they asked me was, don't you think this is a great time for black trans people to make work? And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Mm -hmm. like, what the fuck? I said, most black trans people have made their own jobs. They invented their own jobs because they didn't exist. There were no jobs for them. Yeah. So they literally made their own jobs. That's and then, the yeah, go on. No, that's it. Like, that's literally the tea, like, you know, trying to, at the end of the day, <clears throat> as soon as I transitioned, all I was no longer the fluffy, um, you know, neutered eunuch. You know, that's what I presented before transition. Like, you know, I wasn't a danger. Like for some, you know, for my transness was so, became so noxious that, mm. um, you know, wherever I am on the possibility spectrum and stuff, I was still... It was still not enough, you know, once they found out, you know, just, <clears throat> you know, I didn't have the experience, had too much experience, whatever. Let's just be honest, you just don't want me in the office. Do you know what I mean? Mm, exactly, <laughs> you know, exactly. You don't want me facing clients and whatever, it's too much. Do you know what I mean? And, you know, like, you don't want, you know, the men in the warehouse to be gossiping about me. They so and so today feels uncomfortable. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And, it, like, <clears throat> and so... You know, my writing career, you know, going freelance, you know, like as a slash millennial, it's not fucking fun. Do you know what I mean? It's mm. 
something that I've chosen. Do you know what I mean? This is exactly you know, like, um, of um gigs and career and whatever. It's not it's not sustainable. Exactly. Do you know what I mean, we're having to do GoFundMe's every two fucking seconds because mm -hmm. nothing that is being offered is sustainable. It will mm -hmm. get to the next two months, that's cool. I will be okay, don't get me wrong. But when winter comes around and I'm still unemployed, what am I gonna do then? Yeah. So, yeah. And, then and then because of that, we're losing mm -hmm. like the, the incredible minds that black trans people have, like my friends who I like I know are brilliant. And if you always have to be thinking like, where the fuck, oh, next month, next month, next month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, the, like it's not this thing of like, oh, let's look after black trans. It's like, no, because black trans people are important and brilliant and like, Mm -hmm. are going to be the people who have the ideas that and and the practices that are going to change the fucking world and mm -hmm. it becomes this this totemic thing of like black trans lives but it's just not something to say like mm -hmm. some of the most brilliant people i know the mm -hmm. most brilliant people i know and these but, yeah. without that fucking pressure of like oh so if we're thinking about the future it's also like how what how how do we get it for ourselves and also for Mm. But also, how do we, because we're still doing that? Because one of the things that I think is that, so like I've become, I literally have to now, you know, like I, I, I hate admitting this because part of the thing about that publishing paid me is, is that actually, one, if you're working class and you're poor, mm. you feel ashamed of putting anything up there. Yeah. Mm. And like, so I live, I live by the next, you know, by this, mm. by this kind of thing, paying me thing. Because actually, what happens as well is, is that once you reach a certain age, no fucker wants to listen to you anyway, mm. because because we, we still live in a sexiest world where men go as soon as a woman is over a certain age, she's yeah. got nothing to say, she's got nothing to do, she's no she's no point her opening her legs because I'm not interested in that anymore, and if I'm if she's not going to open her legs, well then she I'm not interested in her brain. Yeah. So mm. it's kind of like so like what happens is is it because I see like I you know I've been trying to write a book of essays about class for like and there's some of the most beautiful things I've ever written. I mean, it could make me cry how kind of like, but, you know, I see a younger person will get their book published about addiction and class and I'll read it and I just go, this doesn't even fucking scrape the surface. Mm. But, you know, it's like when you reach a certain age, you begin to become, and then, then this kind of thing of you're trans and you're a woman and, and I'm pretty damn sure that, you know, the colour of your skin is going to be a major factor in terms of that because you just go, well, then they can disappear. And they can disappear really easily because we weren't really looking at them anyway. And we, weren't, we definitely mm. weren't paying them. They didn't mm. take much. Well. However, the arguments be used, like, have been proven to be fallacious, particularly over the past five, ten years, you know, like, <clears throat> you know, the Alexandra Shulman, who was a former editor of British Vogue, yeah, 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 yeah. about, you know... You know, we can't put a black girl on the coverage. They just don't sell, <laughs> you know, and so and like, you know, then, um, you know, Edward Ellenfield comes along and we've had, you know, we've had so many black um, models. Yeah. I, you know, circulation has increased, like the demands are increasing. But I also think, you know, for me as a black trans writer, a black trans woman who's writing, who's creating, who's got a vision and stuff, you know, when, when I've gone, when I, I'm, you know, People and I'm having I've had meetings with people in publishing and we we'll talked to you know about some lovely white women you know I really, I really have I've had some <laughs> I really have and even though it's not been said explicitly when things have tried to go towards a serious route or whatever the one book deal that I was offered was one with no advance and stuff and. The, comp the person who encouraged me to do it, I knew what they got as an advance. And, you know, the publishers knew that we were friends and whatever, so I assumed that they were at least going to match us up. <clears throat> but they didn't. And so I have to reckon with the fact that it's my um, my blackness, my womanhood, my transness that sees me as a terrible investment. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Whatever. But then you look at the success of something like Pose, a phenomenon, a cultural juggernaut. Do you know what I mean? Never, mm. like, you know, try and t or even a Paris is burning. Do you know mm. what I mean? 30 mm. fucking years later, do you know what I mean? RuPaul's still milking that fucking cow. <laughs> 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 
theme, you know, in the Elysian fields for like all of these people apart from us. Mm. You know I mean? Like, you know, all of the people who either died because of violence, poverty, whatever, mm. you know, they didn't have glittering ends to their lives because mm. they took part in this thing which transformed society. Do you know what I mean? Um, so yeah, it's been it's ridiculous to like for them to try and argue that you know that what we produce just isn't lucrative. It's just yeah, 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 yeah. like literally you feed off us continually. Mm -hmm. And so, like I don't also don't get involved in um conversations about appropriation, or whatever. I expect it. Do you know what I mean? Of course, do you know what I mean? Of course they're gonna want our, our style, our luscious, and I can feel my power. Just walking down the road, I can feel mm. it. You know what I mean, you know, like I feel. Um, I haven't watched this film yet, but is it um, Monica Bellucci? Um, in that, what's that film? Um, it's an Italian film, and she's walking along because uh, it made me you made me think of this, Juno, because you just mentioned getting older and whatever. And I was thinking, yeah, but what are the exceptions? Because then I think of like you know, a Nigella Lawson. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like, yeah, she was getting, she didn't get um, to a certain level of success until she was later in life. But what she represented was a fecundity, you know, mm -hmm. and an availability and mm -hmm. a Mrs. Robinson kind of thing and stuff. So there's a path that they give us as to yeah. how to age as a woman appropriately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Involved, you know, sex, which involves sex, which yeah. is like a sexual route. Yeah, exactly. so, you know, the, the Nigel, uh, Nigella Lawson is. You can be a size sixteen, no more. As it goes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you wear the pencil skirt and you are alluring, and you just <laughs> lick it and stuff. <laughs> Back. So you've got to give the, you know, the Aphrodite. Mm. That's the show I would watch, though, Kajinga. Say again. <laughs> That's a show I would watch, though, you know. <laughs> Delicious. Um, we're coming up. Well, I'm going to have to do my facilitator thing and say we're coming up to time. Um, oh, um, that was nice, though. Um, can I just say one tiny thing? I mean, you I just want to just say. Like, yeah, some say something like. So like I, know, one one what, thing that I'm, I'm horrified that someone offered you a book deal with no book. I mean, that's literally. I mean, that's the most short-sighted thing I've heard in a long while. You, your books will sell masses of, and I know that I listen. I'm a small writer, but I still have had. I've still got three books in the chart that I earn advances on that people told me wouldn't sell a copy, mm -hmm. so they paid me pennies. Yeah, but then you know, at least you didn't have to. <clears throat> you were able to, you know, get the royalties real quick and whatever. So mm. like, absolutely, I, I love that Roxanne Gay did say, "Okay, guys, you know, these six figures, seven figure advances, they may seem dazzling, but it may not pay off for you in the long run." I understand that because absolutely I care about publishing. I care about books. I watch. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I feel like I'm one of the likes, you know. Um, 17 people that watch the Steve, Stephen Fry documentary on the Gothenburg Press. I love <laughs> like it's not even it's not even a choice. I don't write it. I write because it's a calling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I it, it wasn't like a it wasn't a conscious thing in my mind. Like you know, I wrote and I was reading. You know, I grew I grew mm. up in an African household surrounded by books. And because my parents had a colonial education, they it was imperative that you know that my dad read Somerset Mom and Lawrence and whatever. But you know, when they got to um university in the UK, you know, my mum went to LSE and was part of all these um, you know, black women's reading groups and feminist groups, etc. <clears throat> and the new beacon bookshop in um on Stradwing Road and mm. Head Start in Seven Sisters and whatever. So there's this tradition of you know self-education as well as formal education mm -hmm. and stuff and i forget the i gave a gift of the book to a friend of mine um it's called the intellectual life of the british working classes and stuff and i don't think we talk about that as much now how before the digital age there was this rich history of the um english working classes specifically you know educating themselves 
you know, like reading, you know, broadly, widely, you know, even the creation of the National mm. Theatre, you know, on the South Bank and whatever, it, there was this real, you know, socialist underpinning of, you know, this art for everyone kind of movement. And mm. stuff that, like, I feel I, as the, you know, as the recipient of all of that, you know, cultural practice now and stuff, I feel like we are handing that down. There's so much route there's so much opportunity for self-education now mm. and that's why we're talking about the universal basic incomes and the ends of policing and you know we're trying to think of you know how to set up a society that will be of benefit to all of us i mean it is happening at the same time as you know terrible things are happening but mm. there is something unstoppable about our hunger do you know what i mean mm. manifest our best selves of which you know obviously black trans people are at the vanguard of that but you know we're also being killed more prodigiously because we are so dangerous the concept of us do you know what i mean mm. you know, like that to have such strength and softness in one being, oh, oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's a really nice line to, I mean, I'm completely happy to end on that line because, I mean, I yeah. think that's such a, I mean, that's powerful because, <laughs> I mean, it does, I've got to kind of did that to my little polka dot blouse. <laughs> We're done. Thanks. <laughs> hey, Zaz, Thank you're you. back in. <laughs> Because like I kind of imagine to go, oh, we're just gonna like talk about like here's our six point plan for how we make sure trans people grow up, uh, grow old. But actually, I think there's something about what do we do for each other, and how do we have conversations like mm -hmm. this, and how do we like we're gonna we're gonna look after each other. I think <laughs> we have been. I mean, um, we have been for the longest time. Yeah. That we that's in our blood. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Taz. Hello, everyone. Oh, I don't even know what to say. I do know what to say. Oh, wow. Um, thank you so much for this, like, this chat. I feel so full, like, to start my day like this. Wow. Um, <laughs> I just kind of wanted to quickly say something. Um, uh, Daniel made a, a point um, where you said, we kind of have to like reclaim this time back right to the time that we like didn't have before or that we weren't like our, ourselves and weren't able to kind of like just be that out um in the the world um and i feel like this conversation for me is like a reminder of that it's a reminder of um of the time that we are like in now and like you know apologetically being ourselves in this conversation. Um, and especially for me, like I'm 27, um, I kind of, you know, only recently allowed myself to be like, oh yeah, like this is the right term. I'm non-binary, that, that that's it. Like I've always felt it, but I just didn't have that, that term. And to just kind of listen um, to you all speak about your experience with just like, you know, it, I just feel like I was just in that conversation, like I was just like in a coffee shop and we're just together and like really hearing that. Um, so thank you so much for just like bringing that because I am energized, like I feel so like full. Um, yeah, and I've just loved like listening and kind of being in the background. Um, yeah, and just experiencing this, like it's just really beautiful and I'm just glad that like, it feels like this moment was just like, for all the people like you're watching who like aren't queer like y'all y'all just got like this snippet of but also i think that's a really important thing that like this idea of like we need to have more diversity mm. I, like it's not because oh well, you should but because wow it's fucking magic right. when you have trans people and black trans people and queer people like being fully who they are this your life is going to be incredible your workplace is going to be so much better brighter mm. more forward thinking and like it's not like oh we should include these people it's like this is this is the the richness of what happens when you get queer people to queer and trans people together i kind of i i kind of think in one way that i think people sometimes do the bare minimum Mm. to feel like they're doing the right thing mm. like i went shopping like i'm terrified of getting i've lived with a virus for 30 odd years 
that's trying to kill me all the time. So I'm terrified of this virus. I'm literally shit scared of getting another virus. So I wear a mask, mm -hmm. I wear this, I do this. And I went shopping the other day and there was like, I saw a woman in there and she had like a mask and it was down here. <laughs> and it's like, it's like she was just wearing a mask to please something, but she wasn't actually doing anything about the virus. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with the virus. And I think mm -hmm. to a certain extent, that's like people with knees in fields. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like a mask down there somewhere. It, you know, I'm not saying that it doesn't make for a great visual. Mm. It does, especially if there's a sunset. I mean, it, there's something quite beautiful about that. But essentially, the work is the work. Yes. And the work yes. is always being uncomfortable. The work is about discomfort. When in the 80s, when we set up a housing co co corporation in London, a co-op in London, for young queer people, you know, it was work. We had to work on mm. doing it. We had to physically paint houses for somebody that had been kicked out of their house that was homeless, mm. a young guy or whoever it was. I mean, it's that's the thing, and that's that, that's the thing that upsets me a bit about social media is that people assume that there's no work, that a work is just yeah. ticking a box. Mm. The work is always going to be the work. It's always mm. going to be tough. One and it's always people. there, and you don't need someone to tell you to do it. It's always there, and it's something you can do every single fucking day. And like, it's quite easy to find what to do. You just have to like. Mm. To, yeah, like yeah. think about it just to give it more yeah. thought than like oh someone told me to post something i'll post it it's like actually no the work is you thinking every single day like this is this what can yeah. i do to make exactly. that change and seeing that in different spaces right like not just seeing like oh i should post this thing but actually oh like i'm watching this tv show and then you think oh there's actually like there's conversations mixing there's people mixing this conversation and kind of getting into that mindset where you are seeing the work in all areas of life, right? Kind of not just in these one um, particular area. So, yeah, amazing. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so much for, um, for sharing this morning. I feel, like I said, I feel really energised. It was so amazing to just have you, like, on this, on this stage virtually together um it's wonderful so yeah thank thanks you. for the department of the future for having like allowing like creating this space first having this conversation as part of a festival and letting a bunch of trans people swear and shout at each other it's been <laughs> 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 thank you so much everyone take thank care you. thank you for coming um,